Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Faith Tent at Pride Cymru from wherever you're joining us from this afternoon. We're delighted to welcome you online, and I am particularly delighted to welcome our guests this afternoon. We have Father John Connell and the Reverend Dalit Liddell with us this afternoon, and we're here to talk about the Christian faith and its perspectives on conversion therapy. It's a topic that's been in the news a great deal recently, and I'm really grateful for their time in coming to share their knowledge and understanding with us. Uh, Father John is an Anglican priest whose parish is up in Abergavenny, which is in Monmouth Diocese. His last church, having recently arrived in Abergavenny, were a liberal Catholic church uh, who were members of the Inclusive Church Network, and that's something Father John has been very committed to. He's also a member of the governing body of the Church in Wales uh, and is civil partnered to Claudio. He has been a single parent to both of his children for much of their lives and has just become a grandfather. So congratulations again, Father John, on Thank the you. birth of your first grandchild. Uh, Dell is a Methodist minister. She is the Methodist chaplain to Cardiff University and also a pastoral leader at the gathering. Uh, Cardiff, who are one of the sponsoring groups for the Faith Tent. Uh, she is a member of several Methodist church groups, including Dignity and Worth, which is the group in relation to their same sex and gender um, diversity portfolio. Uh, she is working on a project called Justice, Dignity and Solidarity, which is in relation to all issues of inclusivity and diversion within the Methodist Church. You might have heard her on Radio 2 doing Pause for Thought, or have seen that she's recently been reinstated onto the pink list. So congratulations for that, Del, and thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. And now I think the first thing to do is to give a very brief description of conversion therapy, just to make sure that we're all working to the same description. Uh, and that the broadest possible description of conversion therapy, and I do use the word therapy in inverted commas, but that's how it's often described, is any activity that is used to intend to change or change how someone perceives their own gender or sexuality. Uh, the important thing to consider with that is that it doesn't have to be a medical intervention, it's any intervention uh, which can be intended to change someone's gender or sexuality. Uh, so if we can start with John, what position has the Church in Wales taken, John, about conversion therapy? Well, members of the LGBT plus community in the Church in Wales were absolutely delighted uh, when the bench of bishops in the Church in Wales on the 14th of May issued a, a totally unequivocal statement about conversion therapy, um, saying that it was wrong and that it should be uh, condemned and that the government's policy to, to outlaw conversion therapy should, should be enacted. Um, it was very interesting that comparing with other statements from the Church of England, um, which weren't quite so equivocal, the Church in Wales issued a very, very simple statement signed by five out of six bishops um, condemning it unequivocally um, and that made my heart sing. Um, it was really good to hear. And Dal, what, what, what have we heard from the Methodist Conference around this? Well, in the Methodist Church, it's conference who is, who is the deciding body, not, not the bishops like uh, in the Church in Wales. And uh, at this conference just gone this year, um, back in July, uh, that we there was uh, a proposal put to two conference to um, to really state very clearly what our view of conversion therapy was. And I'm so pleased to say, like John, um, that completely passed. In, and it's very clear now from a Methodist church perspective that any sort of prayers for changing of somebody's sexuality or gender is completely not what we do in the Methodist church. It's, it's against our policies. Um, and also on, on top of that, um, it called on our, uh, our president and vice president, the kind of you know, figureheads of the Methodist Church, to write to the government to express the Methodist Church's desire that, uh, yeah, the ban on conversion therapy goes through government. So both churches, it sounds like, have been pretty clear about what their opinion and position is on this matter. Um, as, as you mentioned, the government policy in the Queen's speech last year was to say that conversion therapy will be outright banned. 
but that was followed up by a, a notice from the government that what they intend to do is have a consultation about that policy. And particularly, I'm quoting from the consultation now, to protect the medical profession, to defend freedom of speech and to uphold religious freedom. That consultation has caused some consternation within the LGBTQ plus community. From what we know of it, which is little at this stage, but from that bit that we've read out, how do you feel about that, whether it fits with what your churches have said? Because you've both said your churches have been pretty unambiguous about this. Do you think that consultation about upholding religious freedom is something that your churches are pleased about? Or do you think it just isn't part, of, doesn't fit with their views? I don't think I can really speak for the church because obviously it, within the Methodist Church, it's a broad church. There will be people who have differing views. The, the important thing for us is that our our conference uh, made that statement um, and therefore within the Methodist Church, it's not it's not allowed. I'm really disappointed in that phraseology um, as we come out, as we come towards a consultation because um, religious freedoms. <sighs> and freedom of speech is one thing, but when that religious freedom or freedom of speech is actually, um, is actually ruining somebody's sense of who they are and giving, bringing such shame because of the way that they're being uh, prayed over or, or, you know, delivered or whatever it might be, um, then that's ruining people's lives, frankly. And so, um, yeah, I'm really disappointed that really the, uh, the door has been left open to those who are worried that what they pray is going to be against the law. And actually, sometimes what they pray does need to be against the law. It's interesting that the, um, the key professional bodies um, who deal with mental health and well-being, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, I think, came out against conversion therapy in 2014. The Royal College of General Practitioners in 2019, um, all the key medical bodies say that being gay isn't something to be cured or healed, or you you can't you can't change it through therapy, through through medical science or any kind of treatment, and it's completely wrong to do so. Um, so that should apply equally in terms of the the spiritual fear as well and the world of faith. Um, if if the key medical bodies are saying look, if you try to change the person's sexual orientation or gender identity, however somebody has come to identify themselves as a whole human being, and you tell them that they are wrong for expressing themselves as a gay or lesbian or bisexual person or going on the trans journey, um, to try and, they often call it reparative therapy, which implies that you are repairing something which is broken. LGBTIQ plus people aren't broken and they're on a journey of discovery about their own identity and people should be supported in that journey and given the help and the encouragement they need to work through any negative or confused feelings they have in a non-judgmental, accepting and affirming way. The moment you start saying you want to pray about somebody's um, wrestling with these issues, you're loading the kind of um, psychological dice, aren't you? You're taking a faith view into what should be um, a decision which is about your mental health and well-being. Now, our, our spirituality, who we are as spiritual beings, affects our, our well-being and so on. Um, but the, 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 the whole package of a person's mental, physical, sexual health um, needs considering very, very carefully. Um, and to say that you can, you can simply introduce prayer and spiritual means of changing a person's identity it is wholly wrong and incredibly damaging to people because you're putting on layers of guilt um, and guilt can, can totally destroy people when, when you know, you may feel guilty just for being who you are and who you're discovering yourself to be and that, uh, that can't be right, that can't be helpful or healthful for any person who's who's coming to terms with who they are as a person. Yeah, that's, um, you've both talked about 
prayer in the context of conversion therapy. And that's really helpful for me because one of the things that we hear said by certain Christian organizations is that this is a ban on prayer. If we ban conversion therapy, what we're doing is banning prayer. What would you say to people who are worried that by banning conversion therapy, it will infringe their freedom to practice their faith, either as they're used to doing or as they would want to be able to do? No, nobody's stopping anybody praying, but we're trying to prevent people exercising in a prayer ministry which is harmful and hurtful to people's well-being as they discover and come to terms with their, their gender and sexual identity. And because it's trying to give a steer and to manipulate somebody away from the direction they may be discovering that that's the, that their life is taking and as they're discovering more about themselves and to try and deliberately steer that away from that process of discovery and self-awareness people need help in and support in in a non-judgmental way of discovering who they are so a prayer should be to support somebody in that process um, you know, to, to give them strength and pray that God will give them guidance and confidence to recognise their their belovedness as as a, as a son or daughter of, of God and that they have a unique beauty and identity uh, that, that is God given. And, 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 you know, as it's in Genesis, God saw what he had made, it was good. Uh, God sees created people as, as, as inherently good. And to say that God creates somebody who is... Um, dysfunctional or inherently uh, sinful because of who they are goes completely against how I would understand uh, the Christian faith and understanding of God's uh, love towards creation. Yeah I, I completely agree and um, open prayer you know the kind of prayer that isn't judgmental is is wonderful it's exactly what we do as christians and it's exactly what we want to be speaking to to god about and we can we can pray for individuals as they struggle with and they make this journey but we're not praying to change them and, and that's the crucial thing we must not pray to change them because that causes so much shame in my um in my ministry with lgbt people through the gathering and through other areas I speak to people who, for many, it was many, many years ago that they had somebody pray over them that, that their spirit of gayness would be taken away or that they, they could um, battle against being um, gay. And the pain and the shame that that caused so many years ago is still with them today. And, and I think that that's the problem. Little Mrs. Evans in the little chapel down the road who wants to pray for Joe Bloggs um, over something doesn't understand the damage that that can create in somebody's life and, and how that fractures their very sense of being because they don't feel that they're accepted by God when, as John has said, God loves and accepts all that God has made. I can remember when I was last a vicar in Abergavenny um, about 15 years ago uh, a young man from Newport came to to see me uh, he came via changing attitude in England and um, he rang them up for some help and support um, and he, he just completed a course of Christian instruction and wanted to be confirmed uh, by the bishop in the cathedral in Newport um, but in the last uh, course when they were allowed to last element of the course but allowed to ask questions and he said well I'm I'm a I'm a gay man I'm I'm proud of who I am is my sexual orientation compatible with the Christian faith can I go ahead and take this step of adult commitment in the Christian faith um and he was told by somebody who who, who wasn't an Anglican I listened to that um a much more conservative church um no you can't you should be ashamed of who you are and you must pray that God will cure you of who you are. And if you decide that you can't be healed or cured of your homosexuality, you must make sure that you live a completely celibate life. Um, and this young man came, came to see me. He, he arrived at eight o'clock and he spoke for four hours solid. I didn't say a word. I just listened for four hours as he just 
poured out his life story. And he'd come to this point of wanting to make a real commitment and adult affirmation of his faith. And this had become like a, a brick wall for him taking that step. And over the weeks between when he first came to see me and the date of the confirmation, I had to kind of help him unravel so much of what he'd been told and, and taught and help him to recognise that what God creates is good. Um, that he, his sexuality wasn't a choice or an illness or a disease. It was of the very essence of who he was as a human being, made in God's image and likeness and loved unconditionally by God. And I'm absolutely delighted to say he got confirmed and I went to his confirmation and I, I cried tears of joy to see that young man be able to, to stand there proud for who he was and not be held back on his journey of faith. And thank goodness he's still a member of the church. You know, sadly it drives many people away from the church because if somebody has a negative experience in terms of um, coming out um, and finds the response is wholly negative, people assume that all churches are like that. Uh, they don't take the time or the trouble to find about at the gathering in Cardiff or the inclusive church network that St Augustine's Romney Monash Parish beyond, be, belong to. It, it, it's so hurtful and damaging that so many people just turn their back on the church altogether and that, that's such a great sadness when there are lots of affirming communities which will love them, embrace them, support them, include them, celebrate um, their, their life choices and when they you know enter into a marriage or civil partnership do all they can you know to support them in those wonderful journeys of life um, but for some it's just a closed door and Mm. You know, and, we don't see them. Yeah, and the, and those places they help people to grow in faith as well as you've just you know when we're talking about people who uh, churches like um, the Inclusive Church Network and like the Gathering, um, we're not just we're not just here so that people are suddenly okay. It's the right to be gay. It's actually it, we're a church that enables people to grow in faith, know um, more about God, and to sense that sense um, of God's love for them. And, and to really recognise that um, they're, they're being gay or, or transgender or, or whatever um, is something that is beautiful and a gift of God. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important. And I think the other thing I'd say about what you said, John, is that it does only take one negative com conversation or communication with somebody to actually make people turn away. That's all they need. And that's why it's so, so important to try and provi provide people with the opposite um, and, and with a nurturing and with an encouraging and with an affirming message. Uh, and particularly to let people know that there are places where they can, can find that. Um, and there are many now, I have to say, and that's great. Um, because actually that one awful situation, as you've said, can turn them away from the church and, and often from God too, for good. I, I often feel that with, with particularly with younger people, um, the voices you fear are the voices you hear. Mm -hmm. You don't hear those good, affirming, supportive messages. You just tune into the negative. If you're searching, if you're feeling lost, uncertain about who you are and how you fit in. I mean, I, I think that was the huge tragedy um, at Emmanuel Church um, up near Manchester, where Lizzie Lowe, mm -hmm. a young teenage girl, committed suicide. I mean, her church contained a complete spectrum of views on human sexuality, but the only ones she was tuned into were the negative voices, because the church had no kind of debate about the issue whatsoever. The leadership had said, well, we, we won't discuss this because it's too contentious. So a young girl just hears the negative voices, not the positive ones. Yeah, wow. and, and don't they say that it's something like you need to hear 10 positive ones to every one negative one to yeah. actually, you know, to actually work out that you're any good anyway. So I, I think that's very true. And, and that's really why it's so important that people think very carefully how they pray. So would it be fair listening to you both to say that from your perspectives, 
this doesn't ban any religious practice unless it's doing somebody harm. Yeah, totally. So if people are worried, then actually, if they're not doing anyone any harm, they haven't actually got anything to be worried about. That's right. And but that I think what's really important about having this conversation, not only our conversation, but even the consultation. And what I would want, what I really want people to um, to, to grasp is that it does harm if you pray for somebody to not be gay anymore. That is harming to people. That damages people. That fractures their identity. And that's not okay. And I think what we what I'm hoping that by you know by by what we're doing and by by even the consultation which might be a good thing in this regard who knows let's try um is that 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 conversation will be had in churches so that little Mrs Evans praying for Joe Blocks and the church where she doesn't really yeah you know, she hasn't really got any experience of LGBT people that she knows of and she's you know a fervent wonderful woman of prayer and is deciding I'm going to pray this, knows actually what she's praying is extremely trauma, trauma inducing for the person who she's praying for. And I think that's, that's the message we want to get out. I mean, I mean the, the, there are two, two ways of looking at this. Who is it is who is asking for the conversion therapy or, or for the prayer? Mm. Is it the person themselves um, who said, I don't want to be gay, I'm struggling with being gay, I want to change this, or is it an outside individual, person, group, um, prayer partner, church community, whatever you, who is saying that you shouldn't be gay, therefore we will pray for you. That is coercive. Mm -hmm. but if a person themselves is struggling with their, their sexual or gender identity and needs help with that, uh, the help should not be a kind of loaded faith-based faith-based approach it should be a much more um psychotherapeutic you know health and well-being approach which says well you know why are you struggling with the idea that you might be gay or bi or trans you know what's causing you the trouble with this let's start with that and if it's if if the, if the faith story is the background to that then somebody needs help to unpack all of that but the people to unpack all of that is not somebody from that church community. It's either a professional, professional therapist who has no faith background or somebody who can offer a different narrative, a different um, story about how we see creation and our place within it as LGBT people, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, inherently loved by God for who we are. And you mentioned Lizzie Lowe, John, a moment ago, and I wonder whether that might feature into this. There is so much going on in the world at the moment. Um, one doesn't even want to pick one thing out of what's going on in the world at the moment. What makes this policy, the ban on conversion therapy, a priority uh, when the government's got such a lot to get through in its timetable? Ooh, good question. I, it's damaging to people and we don't want people to be damaged anymore. We want people to feel that they can explore their sexuality or gender identity freely without judgment. And where it causes trauma for people, um, that costs the NHS money. So, you know, there's one, one reason where actually it drives people, and it does, as, as we hear from the Lizzie Lowe um, experience, but there are many, many, many more um, accounts of people who've, uh, who've taken their own lives because of their experience of uh, their gender, sexuality within a church environment. Um, that costs our society dearly, and where one of us hurt, is hurting, we are all hurting. So, um, I think it's an absolute priority. I, I really do. Um, I, I agree with Del. It's the cost on human lives. Mm -hmm. And often these questions arrive, arise at that time, which is hard enough in life. You know, being a teenager, um, you know, doing your exams, thinking about future choices, 
college, university, apprenticeship, employment, we're coming out of a pandemic. There are so many factors uh, that are playing on young people's minds and their mental health. Um, but this is an issue about who you are as a person. It, it's, it's a core issue about your identity. And if you're hurting in, in terms of working out who you are as a person and where your place is in the world, if that isn't important, I don't know what is. And because of the high incidence of, 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 of young LGBT suicides, I think this, this is a really important issue that the government needs to pull its finger out and stop consulting and, and get on with passing the legislation. Because if all the professional bodies that deal with general, physical and mental health are saying, this is wrong, we've been saying it for years, for goodness sake, pass that legislation. Um, they, they need to start doing that. Because between them announcing they're going to do it and having the consultation, there's no doubt that some young people will have a breakdown and may even take their lives. That's the consequence of delaying this. And although there are other big things happening in the world and they, the news is full of, um, you know, the situation in, in Afghanistan and so on, um, there are young LGBT people in Afghanistan who are fearing for their lives um, because of their struggle with their identity and their very, very limited, almost non-existent chance to live happy and fulfilled, meaningful lives in that country as it now is. Um, we can do a small part in our country and hopefully we can be a beacon to other nations to, to, to follow down this path. Um, to make sure the world is a safer place for all LGBTQ plus people. Um, yeah. One of the things that's brought this all back to the public eye so much recently is a Netflix documentary. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Pray Away. It was released on Netflix a fortnight or so ago. Um, and it makes fairly heavy watching. So if there's anyone watching who hasn't seen it, please take this as a trigger warning to watch it with caution uh, because it, it makes fairly heavy watching and has some fairly explicit videos in it relating to um, conversion therapy practices from the last ooh, 30, 40 years or so. Um, but I watched it and I'm glad that I, painful though it was, I'm glad that I did because it made this really present to me uh, as an issue. Um, and I noticed it might perhaps be being a bisexual person watching it. I noticed how heavily the, the narrative structures and the underpinning ideas to the conversion therapy relies on a stereotyped and binary worldview in which women are one way, men are one way, and in which there are only straight people or gay people. Uh, one of the stories is from a bisexual person, and it's very clear that even though she eventually had a happy marriage with a man, conversion therapy did her a huge amount of harm because it denied her identity as a bisexual person. And I wondered um, what your thoughts were really on that kind of stereotyping and aggressive binary um, and the effect that that has for the whole of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, particularly perhaps the gender diverse or sexuality diverse folks for whom the binary just doesn't fit at all. I don't know why as a human society, we are so totally fixated on binaries. Um, you know, it, it just drives me up the wall. Um, and, uh, and, and in the Bible where it says, you know, um, I'm going to struggle to quote this correctly now, um, uh, uh, Greek or Jew, slave or free, male or female, you know, Christ Jesus is in all and with all. And yes, OK, they are binaries there. But actually what it's saying is that Christ is in all and with all. And so we don't, like, why do we have to focus so much on the heteronormative society of um, the, you know, the husband and wife and the 2.4 kids or whatever it is? It's, it just drives me up the wall, to be honest. I did watch that documentary, um, Ruth, and I was, yeah, I was really quite shocked by it. Um, but also not shocked by it because, you know, the stuff that was happening within that, I have either witnessed myself or have 
you know, I've heard of people and we've people within the gathering for whom certain worship songs will be trigger, triggering for them, because for them, it's, it's perhaps the song that was playing when somebody prayed over them in, in that way. And, you know, it's just so damaging what's happened. But anyway, I, I digress then, I think, because your point was about binaries and um, why we can't see that we are a rainbow of people. We are not, uh, you know, everyone's individual. Everyone's got their own um, things going on. I'm, you know, I'm a mum, I'm a, I'm a partner, I'm a, you know, I'm a church minister, a chaplain. I, you know, I've got so many hats. We're all, you know, you can't, you can't pigeonhole me into any one particular thing without denying everything else. And, and, um, and I think that goes the same for male and female, um, to be honest, or gay and straight. You can't do it. We're a rainbow colours in between. I mean, I, I think the, the psychology behind much conversion therapy and reparative therapy um, is underpinned by this binary view of the world, isn't it? You know, and the way that they try and explain uh, that men become gay is because they, they don't see enough of their father, they don't play enough, um, you know, manly sports. Uh, my dad was a farmer, we sat down at every meal together. Um, I went to one of the North's um, rugby schools, I played rugby seemingly every other lesson, and I still end up a gay man, you know. So I've had all the sort of masculinity stuff from, from the moment I went to school um, and I was brought up in a happy and secure family. They want to have this simplistic way of saying, if, if men don't follow this course, they will end up being gay because they haven't got good positive role models because their mother was over, overwhelming and domineering and so on. Um, and you think, hang on a second, this, this is outdated, outmoded, discredited psychology. That's and rubbish. Uh, utter rubbish. And it's, then it's the reverse for women, isn't it? You know, um, you haven't had enough female role models, you haven't been allowed to wear makeup and so on. I mean, even the, the people who, who were behind Exodus and the great, the, the most popular ministries um, in the ex-gay movement, supposedly ex-gay movement, um, admit that the psychology that they used was, it was the stuff of uh, work seminars, wasn't it? Pop, pop psych. It wasn't rooted or grounded. Yes, they have these people who have got PhDs and, oh yes, we've got all these um, all these wonderful documents here and it's peer reviewed and all the rest of it. Absolute nonsense. It was a con, an utter con. And if you, if you were to get the Royal College of Psychiatrists or the Ameri American College of Psychiatrists to look at the truth, they'd say, this, this is just manipulative, manipulative nonsense. This isn't psychology um, and it's doing harm not good. Um, and those who, or many people who are responsible for it, recognise that. And, and the, there's, there's, the most shameful thing of all, I think, is that so many of the leaders of this movement, who said they've been healed, repaired, converted, what have you, that they'd left behind their lesbian or gay lifestyle, were either living that lifestyle, or pretending to be heterosexual, um, or then admitted that they were gay or lesbian or bi and came out afterwards. Um, so for me, it's got no credibility, no, um, no authenticity at all. And one of the interesting things on that program was how they said how so many people have been tempted to contemplate suicide. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear anybody say so many people had committed mm -hmm. suicide as though there were still trying to escape from the blame that, that, that is rightly theirs. Um, I mean, so many of them were trying to undo that, you know, make reparation for that blame. Um, but they have seriously damaged lives. And, you know, um, some of them dedicated themselves to, to, to having support groups and networks to help people work through the issues they'd, they'd been involved in. But I, I think it should have been something completely separate, you know, you go away and live your own life now, whatever. You've done the damage already. I don't think you can put it right. Um, that should be for mainstream medical and psychiatric care. I think what was quite horrifying as well about that, um, that 
program is that it did show that there's a, a new and current movement that's taking over from Exodus that is still attempting to pray the gay away. Um, and that, I mean, I know we're talking about in the States, but it seems like it, you know, and, and to be fair, I think we were talking about pretty small numbers that, that this guy had uh, engaged with already. But even so, to actually have that as a part of the program to say that this is still going on is is horrifying um to to find that out that there are other and there are other organizations popping up because exodus is, is now uh now not there um trying to change people uh through conversion therapy it's just it's horrifying i mean i know that's the states um but i think we do need to be aware of the the uh, popular culture that um you know seeps through to to us here in the uk I mean, there are organisations in the UK and Northern Ireland um, that are, you know, yeah. exercising conversion therapy. Yeah. Um, one in Northern Ireland that's a lot of publicity. Um, and gosh, um, you know, he's claiming the religious freedom card and saying if people make a choice and want to that. But why are they making, yeah. making that decision to say, I want to be cured of my homosexuality? It's because there's a construct behind it. And you've been made to feel guilty for who you are as a child of God, simply because you are identifying as a member of the LGBTQ plus family. Um, and that, that's wholly wrong, wholly wrong. And that can sometimes, you know, pressure can be put on by the people who are around them, whether that's family members or, or their church family. And that's why I think it's so important that the message needs to get out to folks that there are other places where you can, as you said earlier, John, where you can hear a different narrative and you can hear that God loves you and that you can be a Christian and be gay or transgender or bisexual or um, and, and or lesbian and and experience the the love of god and and have a, a truly fulfilling beautiful christian faith and and uh, life in god i was a gene robbins i think he said um how is it you can be condemned for preaching about god's overwhelming love for the lgbt plus community uh, yet you tend not to be condemned if you preach hatred and anger towards the lgbt plus community um, you're being condemned for being too loving in your preaching. Um, um, very sad. Very sad. Two words that have really stuck out to me from what you've been saying the past five minutes or so are authenticity and stereotypes. And it, I wonder whether there's something in this about stereotypes rob everyone of their authenticity, actually gay, straight, bisexual, wherever we fall within the LGBTQ plus community, whatever our gender identity, if we're being asked to live as a stereotype, then actually none of us is being afforded our authentic life experience. I completely agree. Um, and it, it always makes me it always makes me smile when I blow people's minds that of, a, of the stereotype of being a minister or a Methodist minister. And, uh, you know, the stereotype of that is that, you know, I mean, you certainly wouldn't be gay or fighting for LGBT rights uh, with both within the church and out of the church. Um, and so they're kind of like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and and. Uh, you know, I think that's what we all need to be to do in order to be authentic to who God calls us to be and who God and, and to what God calls us to do. It's it's to crack on and do it. And if that blows people's minds around you, well, that's their problem. Uh, and it's not just a message about who we are. It's about who we can be, who we can become, um, you know, uh, in, in the Christian faith. Um, as we grow as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, uh, and, and know his love in our lives, the likeness of Jesus is formed more fully within us. We become more Christ-like. We become more fully the person God calls us to be. Um, and that's beautifully uh, rainbow-coloured. Uh, you know, it's not, um, it's not um, a moment where it's um, that simple acceptance of who you are, and that's the end of a journey. You, you can grow in God's love as an LGBT plus person um, and, and know that love through the whole of your Christian journey. And that's, that's a wonderful um, 
journey of, of surprising discovery, mm. you know, as you come to realise more and more just how beloved you are of God um, and that the fact that you are identify as gay, straight, bi, trans, what have you, it, it just doesn't stop that love coming towards you and, and embracing you and enfolding you, um, you know. Mm. Well, that's a lovely space to start to wrap up our conversation from. Thank you, John and Del. Uh, I just wanted to give an opportunity for both of you to shout out some of the safe spaces or safe groups within your organisations where if someone has been upset by watching Pray Away or one of the other documentaries that's doing the rounds, or if we have anyone listening who is dealing with the consequences of having been subjected to conversion therapy, places where they can go and know that they will, that they will be safe. Uh, well, my shout out first has to be for The Gathering Cardiff, which as you said, Ruth is uh, sponsoring uh, what we're doing here anyway. Um, and hopefully Ruth will put the details up for The Gathering Cardiff. Um, so you can find us on the website or you can find us on Facebook. Um, and, and we are a worshipping community of LGBT people um, and the leaders would be very willing to talk with anyone who has either experienced conversion therapy or is, um, is traumatised by that or um, just wants to talk about being LGBT and, uh, and, and being a person of faith. So yeah, definitely contact us. Just with my Methodist hat on, I did say I wore different hats. Um, if you're a Methodist and uh, you want to be involved with what we're doing in the Methodist Church in terms of um, uh, gender and sexuality inclusion, then Dignity and Worth is the place to go for that. Um, and then finally, if you're in any church where you are worried by what people have said to you or you're experiencing the um, the discrimination, frankly, or homophobia or transphobia of, of the members around you, one of the places to go would be your church leadership. But I would say if within your church leadership, you are not getting um, a sympathetic response, there are other church leaders in your town, in your village, in, in your city, in your area, who will be able to be supportive to you. And it might take a bit of digging for you to find those, but um, I'm sure John will mention the Inclusive Church Network shortly, um, uh, but you can find them and people will support you, pray with you um, in the best way and, uh, and enable you to live as you are um, and be a child of God. Uh, just to follow on from Delith, uh, if you feel safe and secure enough in, in who you are as an LGBT person and are concerned about your church, yes, certainly go and talk to your leadership because you may discover that your leadership in your church are going through the same discussion and debate themselves. Um, I was really surprised when I got a phone call when I was in Romney um, from an elder of one of the larger Baptist churches in Cardiff who wanted to come and talk to me as an Anglican about our inclusive church journey and what steps we'd, we'd taken on that journey because that was a discussion they were having in their church. And, and I thought, crikey, that was one of the last churches I imagine would be going on this journey that they would have a fixed position. Um, so if things aren't being talked about, try and get people talking about the issue. See your leadership, talk to your friends, people you trust and feel safe within church and get the debate going. Um, as an Anglican, if you go on Inclusive Church Network, um, you can find Anglican churches and some other denominations part of that network too around Wales. There's a big concentration in Cardiff, I think some in Mid Wales and North Wales, in the Diocese of Bangor in North West Wales, and the Diocese of St Asaph in North East Wales, there's an LGBT plus chaplaincy, um, which is supported by the church, uh, by the bishops of Bangor and St Asaph, by local clergy, and they have quite active groups. Uh, there's the um, Open Table Network, uh, which is very welcoming and affirming and encouraging LGBT people to LGBT people to gather together and to share in, 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 in fellowship and meals together and in the Eucharist together to break bread and to share the life of Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, the Church in Wales is going on a journey. We're a little bit behind our Methodist uh, sisters and brothers, um, but do pray for the Church in Wales 
uh, because in governing body in two weeks time we're voting on the blessing of same-sex marriages and civil partnerships um, in church and um, for us it's a significant step on the journey towards uh, full equality in terms of marriage in the church in Wales. Uh, so do pray for us and do keep an eye out for the debate and discussion around it and make your views known. If you're a member of the church in Wales, write to your bishop, express your support um, because our voices need to be heard. That's a really helpful link, John, to what I was going to ask you last, which is if there's anyone watching who has been stirred up to action by what we've been talking about, who says there's some, I want to take a positive step, what step can I take? What practical, practical advice and in fact, prayer advice do you have for that for me and for everyone watching this discussion who wants to wants to do something to help us to get this conversion therapy ban in place and promote the full equality of LGBTQ plus people within our churches? Well, it's going through Parliament, so I think you should be writing to your Member of Parliament. Um, even if, you know, they take a Conservative position on it, your voice needs to be heard. Get your view across. Um, encourage people in your church community uh, to write to your MP to say that you are opposed um, to conversion therapy and you want to support and encourage the government to get this public consultation well and truly wrapped up and the bill laid before Parliament, because I, I, I think with the, the figures in Parliament, it will pass quite easily. The government just needs to get on and do it and make young LGBT lives so much safer uh, by banning this um, horrendous practice. Yeah, well, totally, that's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? Um, and, and you know, you talked about um, prayer there as well, uh, Ruth. I think let's let's pray. You know, God hears us, and God hears the prayers of uh, God's faithful, and we we can pray about this situation. We can pray that the conversion therapy bill will go through and will be passed, and we can pray for our um, our siblings in churches who actually are damaging people we can pray for them um that their eyes are opened to the damage that they do when they pray the gay away well just to finish off with some thank yous then the first will be to say thank you to uh, the organizations that sponsor the faith tent at pride cymru and have made this conversation possible so that's thanks to the diocese of llandaff from the church in wales and to the gathering cardiff uh, we've talked about both of those organizations a lot during the last ooh, nearly an hour now uh, but thank you very much to them for their ongoing support this just wouldn't be possible without them uh, and thank you to their representatives who they have with me this afternoon father john connell and the reverend del liddell it has been brilliant to listen to your wisdom and to be inspired by you thank you for giving up your time uh, and i will join you del in praying that we get this horrible practice banned uh, and that the hopes of both the anglican and methodist churches are fulfilled in that thank you very much everyone thank you and thank you to you Ruth too.